um, is that I am consumed with an absolute need to be certain that what I say has a legitimate basis in fact, in science, <laughs> reality, and in logic. And, um, I, you know, I, I can't simply say something. This is what I have a difficult time with. I have a terribly difficult time with um, fundamentalists because of the faith factor. You know, y you have to have faith. But then I find out that I'm not asked really to have faith in God. I'm asked to have faith in their version of God. And that's a problem. And then, of course, when I come into the New Age circles, you know, I get on the Internet and the people are saying things, and they're saying them out of, out of their uh, channeling or whatever. And I have no, you know, I have no business to question any of it. But I've been down all of that pathway, and, and I have a problem with not being able to logically prove at least the source of where we're getting this information from. And then, of course, if, I, if a question is addressed to me, then I have to stop, because as soon as somebody asks me a question, I realize that if that person is concerned about something I might have said, then maybe somebody else is. And, and that is extremely troubling to me. Uh, you know, it, it becomes obsessive to me. I mean, you step up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning trying to find out and make sure that what I'm saying has some basis. And, and, and one of the things that occurred last week, the gentleman, when I mentioned about atom and atom, and, and if you remember, I, I, we've gone through this, and to use a symbolic statement, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but nonetheless, uh, it's very important to me because if they're not the same, then, you know, I have no business in saying they are because everything starts from that point. We looked at angel and angle. We looked at leaven and heaven. But a question was raised about Adam and Adam. And the reason was because I said, well, look, Adam had a rib removed and then Eve was made. So I said, well, that would equate to an atom having an electron removed. And so we're talking about splitting the atom. And the question or the statement was then made, well, in the process of this, an, an electron is not removed. So, you know, of course, that would leave you wondering, well, you know, where did he get this from? Or did he make this up or what? So if you take a, a rib out of Adam, or if an electron is removed from Adam. But I mean, you know, the, the, the point was raised that an electron is not removed from Adam, so then, you know, you, what do you do with that? You know, this, like, I sat at lunch with Albert, and, you know, as Albert was saying, this is a very complex thing. You just can't break this down. I mean, there's all variations of what goes on in the subatomic world. I mean, you know, God. But still in all, I'm not a nuclear scientist or a physicist in any way, shape, or form, but we could just generally look at this and say, well, removing a rib from atom could be splitting the atom. That, maybe that should be enough. But then when I start, to, well, you, know, take, you take the rib out of atom is like taking an electron out of an atom. And then somebody says, well, you don't take an electron out of an atom. So there's a question raised. But I have to address that question because ever since that uh, statement, then I have been obsessed all week with, you know, what's going on here. I mean, because I don't want to say anything that doesn't have some basis in fact, because that's not fair to you. And I don't want to continue and, and have people running out and, and saying things and have somebody tell you, no, well, that's wrong. That's not right. What he's saying is wrong. And then that then kind of inhibits maybe your thoughts of any credibility that I might have. Bill, it may not be an electron, but something does come out of the atom and, and becomes energy. Electron. Not matter. I still know it's an electron. 
I do know it's electron, and that's what I'm going to be here to show you. That's what I spent my week obsessed with finding, you know. So, um, but I will show you a picture of it coming out today uh, from the Encyclopedia of Science. So that's, 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 what, that's, what, that's what I'm concerned about. Um, but anyhow, what you do, Bob, but to, 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 to let you understand uh, what I found, if you ever heard of the word ion, I-O-N, an ion is an atom who has lost an electron or gained an electron. That's what it is. And, um, but, we'll, but, but see, please don't misunderstand. The question or the thought is not bad at all. The question or the thought is extremely helpful and extremely positive. I know like Regina and I went through uh, some things with people. But these things stimulate you to look further. They stimulate you to look deeper. And, 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 and when you look further and you look deeper, you come up with other things. There is a responsibility that when you say something about these things that, you know, you, you're able to document. But of course, when you get into a structure such as this, or when I'm in New York, or now we have another meeting place that up in Carlstadt, when somebody does raise something like this, it's, it, it, it generally is not the time or place to get into a, to a drawing out a conversation about it. It's better to, you know, think about it and come back. So that's what I wanted to do just for a few moments this morning before we go on. What we do here sometimes is, is we, we come to the point where you know, we, we've invented uh, or we've we discovered nuclear energy and we've invented all of these different things and, and we feel that you know, we're, we're quite advanced in our, in our understanding of things. But if you, if you look at page 567 in the Bible and you get to the book of, uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes and there's this wonderful line that should alert us all to, to what's being said here if, if this book has any basis in, in, in logic or, or, or fact. It says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9, the thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It has been already of old time, which was before us. And that's very interesting, and that's quite a statement. Because, you know, we've got rockets, and we've got all kinds of scientific wonders that, that we say, gee, you know, look what, look what we've discovered. But then we find out, if we look at something like this, that, hey, wait a minute, that which has been is that which shall be. So it doesn't matter how grotesque or how bizarre the letter is or the scriptures may be, it is the symbolism alone which is precious and worthy of us to look at. And it's a, you know, I, I, I am absolutely amazed the more I, I, I think of it how, you know, as a parent, how concerned you are about your children and what your children learn, what your children are taught. And, and children go into school, and, and the greatest thing in the world, and probably the most maligned people in the world, are teachers who teach the children of history and of logic and of science and of, and, and of fact, you know. And, and, and sometimes teachers are maligned because, well, the kids don't know this or don't know that. And then on Sunday, we take all these kids into Sunday school and teach them bizarre things like God took a rib out of an atom and made this woman out of spare ribs. And, and you know, oh, this is one. And, and, and we're very happy that we're bringing our children up in a responsible way because we've, we've totally missed. It is astounding to me how the Western culture, our culture, as, as, as intelligent as we are, have no knowledge whatsoever of the art of mythology, the art of allegory, the art of parable. We don't know it. Yet we pick up Eastern books and read them. We're reading Eastern books literally. And children, kids, know nothing, absolutely nothing about I mean, this is, this is amazing. If indeed this is talking about nuclear fission, it's done so 5,000 years ago. If we're gonna if we're gonna take it literally, and we're gonna say, well, what all this is is a book where they were given instructions to these tribes how you know how to kind of become civilized, then you're totally discounting the essence of mythology. If you have a book, if you're gonna use a book or a document like this, and all the Western religions do, then 
you have to consider what plays a part in understanding this. The very book in 2 Corinthians 3, 6 says, be not a minister of the letter. I interpret that to say, don't take this literally. Somebody else might say, well, I don't think that's what it means. But that's what it says. It says in Matthew 13, 34, Jesus never spoke but in a parable. That means that everything he said was a riddle. Everything he said was a riddle. It says in Galatians 4.24, talking of the Old Testament, which things are an allegory. It's all symbolic. There's not a church up or down this highway that doesn't consider all of this to be literal. In Psalm 78.2, it says of God, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. That was written 5,000 years ago. What the heck are dark sayings of old to somebody 5,000 years ago? What's a dark saying? Let's go shoot the bull. Albert was three sheets to the wind. <laughs> but it means those are dark sayings. They're symbols. They don't mean what they say. I said, what did I say a moment ago? I don't want to beat a dead horse. It's a symbol. It's a dark saying. It says in Proverbs 1.6, to understand a proverb and its interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, and we don't. And we, we send kids by the thousands upon thousands through these Sunday schools and read this literally. They really believe there was an ark. They really believe that there was a snake talking to people. Got to have it. Oh, they got to go and listen to this. And yet, if, if, you, if you send them into school, we have responsible teachers who are trying to, you know, God. Now, I ask you, it says in the Bible, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he took one of his ribs, and he closed up the flesh, and with that rib he made a woman. Is this saying that life originated from the splitting of the Adam, or is it saying that you know, a woman is made out of spare ribs? Is it saying that an electron moved from one atom to another atom to complete the relationship. Atom, atom. Is it saying that? Is that possible to conceive that? Are you saying, well, what are you saying? There was two atoms? Yes. There wasn't ever one atom. Open the Bible just for a minute with me because I want to show you something you may never have seen. There is two Genesis, you know. There's a Genesis that talks about the development of consciousness, of fear, of temptation, you know, getting kicked out of the garden, Eve, the snake, the talk. I mean, as soon as you know there's a talking snake, you know there's no Eve because she was talking to the snake. If there's no talking snake, then there can't be an Eve because she was talking to the snake. So then you, you'd have to say the whole thing. Wait a minute, what? I'm, I'm reading this as a myth. If there was Eve talking to a snake, then there was a Medusa with snakes growing out of her head. It's the same stuff. So. But anyhow, let me show you the other Genesis in which there is no Eve, there's no Cain and Abel, there's no garden. It's on page four, and it talks about the two Adams. And it's in Genesis chapter five. This is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day God created man, in the likeness that God made he him. Male and female created he them. You don't have any problem with that. And bless them, you have no problem with that. This is where you may have a problem. Male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam. Their name Adam. This is how he called his name Adam and calls his name Eve. He called their name Adam. Male and female. All were Adam. Okay? So that's the second Genesis. And if you, as you read through it, you find out there's no Eve, there's no Cain and Abel, there's no garden, there's none of that stuff. So now, first of all, if Brother John would come up, Brother John, geez, that takes me back. Remember those days when he used to be brother of brother of and sister? Oh, man, I said, don't, you know, just, just call me Bill, please. <laughs> oh, brother. 
Uh, John, thank you. The, the numbers of the, of the overheads are on there. Okay. What I wanted to show you first was to take a look at the splitting of the atom. Oh, let me, so, number nine. Okay. Appreciate that, John. Yeah, that's great. Um, here we are with this. Yeah, that's it. You had it right. That, no, that was, that was fine. Yeah, that was fine. Okay. Now, can we say that the neutron is God? All right? God impacts Adam. Adam splits in something called fission. Oh, wait to hear this. Wait to hear this. And I made this up. You're going to love it. <laughs> Do you ever go down Route 9 and see these people by the nuclear plant fishing in the lake? Yeah. Do you know what that is? That's called nuclear fission. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. That was good. Yes. Is there a light there that you can shut off? Is there a light there that you can shut off for that? I think we can. All right? Okay. Can you see it then, uh, Charles? Okay. So if God, neutron, Adam, and now look what we've got here. We've got Adam and Eve. Okay? Now, let us then consider the fact that what this is is uranium-235. What is so interesting about uranium-225 with the capacity to split like that and make two is the origin of the word uranium comes from the word Uranus. And the word Uranus in Greek means heaven. And the word Uranus also, if you look it up and you have it in your stuff there, means son of, son of man. So that's interesting too, okay? Now, let's look here at a nuclear chain reaction, which is in number 10. You don't have to put those back in, John. You can just pull them out, and I can put them back in later. But we're going to look at a nuclear chain reaction here, okay? Let's consider God at the top. God touches Adam. Now we have Adam and Eve, okay? Adam and Eve and split. We have Cain and Abel. And then we have this continued chain reaction of creation, okay? The, the, the split goes on and on. So splitting the atom certainly does cause a chain reaction of energy. It certainly makes more sense to look at this and say, if this is God and this is Adam, okay, now we've got Adam and Eve, than to say, uh, you know, we took a rib out and made this lady out of a spare rib or something like that. That makes sense, okay? Now... If you would turn the light back on, okay. Just you might you might as well leave that on for a while, don't you? If we, all right, take that uh, that one off. If we, what do I got? What's this in front of me? The podium. Leave it on. That's what we can do. Oh, you turn turn the light off. Yeah, that's right. Good thing I thought of that. <laughs> Now, when we think of this, this is the question that was raised last week, all right? When we think of the rib coming out of Adam, A-D-A-M, could that be an electron coming out of atom. Now, that was the question last week, and the question was, well, that doesn't happen. And please don't misread this thing. There was nothing wrong with the person expressing that. It just has to make all of us, and that's the way we learn these things together, because I say things, I remember the time that I said, well, it's the sun that goes around, and Mike Roska said, no, it's not, and so we corrected that. So we correct our course. It's no problem here. If it's not an electron, it's something else, it's energy, but it would still be the splitting of the atom, and I think we could all, but that's not, was it good enough? Because I said the electron comes out of the atom. And, all right. If we think of an electron leaving an atom and going to another atom. So if this atom and the electron goes out of that atom to the other atom, which is Eve, is that possible? Now, before you say, well, 
no, it doesn't work that way. I would like you to open to page 103 in, in the material that I have. No, in fact, it's just what I gave you today. All right? The material is what I gave you today. This is the new one. And we look up the word ion. The word ion is an atom or a group of atoms that has acquired a net electric charge by gaining or losing one or more electrons. An atom that has an electron leave it is called an ion. It's from the Greek ion that means something that goes. Okay, and you, and you can see that. So, so indeed, we have a situation then where you have an atom, right? When the electron leaves the atom, it's an ion. You have an atom. When the atom receives an electron, it's an ion. And this is the basis of all life. This is the basis of the electricity that you have. Because when that atom loses an electron, it becomes a positive ion. And when this atom receives the electron, it becomes a negative ion. That's the way it works. So if Adam has a rib taken and the rib happens to be an electron, it makes Adam a positive ion. If this Adam, who is e which is neutral, receives the electron, it makes this a negative ion. So we have the positive, we have the negative, we have the male, we have the female, we have the structure together, and we have the harmony of the two, and it's complete. And that's the way it works. Right. So we know that an atom can lose an electron, don't we? Because you see it there. Does it say it there? I mean, it just says an electron goes out of an atom. Now, what else do we know? We know that Adam lost a rib. OK. So let's go back. We looked at chain reaction a minute ago. And let's look at the material that we have on page 42 here. And it's in a word called polymerization. Polymerization. It's on page 42. On page 42, in polymerization, it talks about an initial step, and so forth. Now, what happens in polymerization, which is a transfer of ions, it happens in polymerization. It says that the initiator or the catalyst forms the first intermediate compound. So we're going to call the catalyst or the initiator God. The initiator God forms the first intermediate compound which is Adam. OK, so that we have. Now what happened? Do, we all agree that the Bible is right. God created Adam. That, and that, that, that goes along with what this says. OK? Then what it says here is then the Second step occurs when the intermediate compound atom, okay, reacts with the original compound God to form additional intermediate products, Eve. God, catalyst, creates atom, intermediate compound. God then interacts with atom, removes rib and forms additional intermediate compounds, E, and so forth and so on. That basically is what happens. That basically is the way that this occurs. Now, let us, if John can come back up, let, let me show you this in, uh, scientifically. If, could you just turn that? Yeah, that's good. John, if you would. Uh, Turn that on. And if you pull out uh, all the way to the back, number 50. Okay? 
and, le and let me let me show you let me show you how this works. Let me show you this Adam and Eve thing uh, from the the Academy of Science. Okay, that's fine. There it is. All right. Here you have an atom. This is Adam. From this atom is the transfer of an electron. The electron is being removed from this atom. Okay, and it's going to go into this atom. This is a chlorine atom. This is a sodium atom. When this transfer from this atom to this atom takes place of the electron, something is going to be here that was never here before. It's called sodium chloride. Sodium chloride doesn't exist. Eve doesn't exist. But when the electron leaves this atom, transfer of the electron, and goes into this atom, sodium chloride will exist that did not exist before. Here's a neutral atom called Eve. Here's a, a neutral atom called Adam. That's not going to make it as far as life is concerned. In order for this to work, this has to be a positive. This has to be a negative. That's the only way things can work. So in order to make this a positive and this a negative, God removes an electron. See, God? Boop, 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 boop. See? God removes an electron, and as soon as the electron leaves, atom becomes positive. This atom receives the electron, and it no longer is a neutral atom. It is now Eve, and it's negative. Positive, negative, we have life. We have energy. We have the universe. And now, bang, 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 and going all over the place. I want you to see, this is called an ionic bond. An ion is an atom that has received or lost an electron. I wanted you to see with your own eyes atoms with an exchange, a transfer of an electron. <coughs> so is it possible to take an electron out of an atom, place it into another atom? Not only is it possible, it's absolutely essential. Does the Bible say God took something out of one and put it into another? Yes. Okay. Uh, lights, please. Now, now, now hold, hold the light for a minute. I want to show you something else. John, could you do the next one, number 51, please? What I want to show you in number 51 is something called cell division. This is cell division. And cell division, along the bottom here, if you could raise this one up towards a little bit so they could see that. You see the bottom? Look at the cell. And you'll see the gradual change of the cell into two. It's called, and in, in, in also in science, it's called asexual reproduction. The splitting of an existing cell into two. What does this is something called mitosis, M-I-T-O-S-I-S, -I -S, is the splitting of a cell into two. It's a division of a cell into two. Mitosis is called by fission. It's caused by fission, nuclear fission, because all this is atoms. So it gets very complex indeed, very subatomic indeed. But this is the basis of what the Bible says goes on. All of this is atom. It's all splitting. Look, there's Adam. Look, there's Adam and Eve. You see? And it all happens. Uh, an asexual reproductive thing. Is it, is it in which a unicellular or one cell splits into what they call daughter cells? All right? So basically, you, you want to just lower that again? This is cell division. New cells are formed by cell division, the splitting of an existing cell into two. And cells divide by a process called mitosis. And, and, if you, and if you were to look in uh, the word in mitosis, you'll find that it's caused by fission. John, thank you very much. OK, we can put that, that light back on. Now, if you look on page 27 of, of the stuff that you have, on page 27 of the stuff that you have, remember, what did it say? The cell divides by fission. If you look at fission on page 27, the act of splitting into parts. 
And then it says in biology, an asexual reproductive process in which a unicellular, that's one organism, divides into two or more independently maturing daughter cells, Eve. All right? So what I wanted to show you is, number one, atoms split. Number two, electrons are removed or can move from one atom to another, becoming ions. And when they do, they bring a harmony between the two atoms of the male and female positive and negative energy source. And that's basically what you're reading about on page one of the Bible. See, I don't want to, but, but just listen to me, then we'll, we'll move on. And th this is it. We're not going to do this anymore. In the world of ionic bonds, this happens. There is something called magnesium oxide, but it doesn't exist until a magnesium atom transfers two electrons to an oxygen atom. When the magnesium atom transfers two electrons to an oxygen atom, all of a sudden there's magnesium oxide there, which was never there before. So if magnesium here, oxygen here, if this one over here on the right was Eve, Eve doesn't exist until the transfer of that electron occurs. A calcium atom transfers an electron to a fluorine atom, which is then turned into something called calcium fluoride. Splitting the atom to create life, there you have it. So now what you have to do is finally say this. Well, this is the end of it. We have a choice. A transfer of electrons represented by a rib to create something new, Eve, or women made of spare ribs. And you, and, and you, just, you just make your decision. You decide. Can't take any more, huh, Albert? Can't take any more. This is all nice. <laughs> <laughs> that was great. Okay. All right. So basically, I myself have put myself at rest with this. I feel extremely confident that this is exactly what occurred here. I have no doubt whatsoever in my mind that it is possible to take something from one atom, put it into another atom, and change that atom into something that it wasn't before. And you've seen this, and we've talked about this, and we've seen it happen, OK? Now, let me go on, and let's start then to talk and, and go back up into the cosmos to supernova 1987A. And yes? What is it? Yeah. No, I mean it's it's in every every thing that exists that is an energy base in the universe is a negative and a positive. It's it's it is. It's in everything. And uh, but you know it's so important to me that you are able if you look at this Bible because what we're talking about here is that. The people, say, 5,000 years ago, somehow, out of the dream state, out of the imagination state, that's what Joseph Campbell said, out of that state come these strange words about the man and the rib and then the woman and then the children and all of this stuff and then all creation comes. And, and this comes out of somebody, but it's coming out of the deep realm of subconscious where the truth is made. Though this person who wrote this may created this story out of, out of this inspiration, out of this dream or whatever, not knowing that this was talking about atoms and electrons, nonetheless it was because it all comes out of that same source. At the time this was written, there were atoms and electrons. There was, there was all of this stuff. And so somewhere out of the great black hole of, of cosmic consciousness comes this stuff. And then, and then, you have the opportunity as an adult, maturing, evolving person to see and to, and to say, look, this is, what, this is what this dream was. This is what this myth is. All of the Greek myths, all of the Egyptian myths can be broken. All of the codes can be broken. And, and, and the universe would flourish. But most of our intellectuals in this country, especially other than those who you know, would listen to Joseph Campbell or Carl Jung, think 
Your kids going to school having a clue. They having a clue. They think, you know, they look at the stories of the Greeks and Pegasus and all oh, those these crazy stories. Because the people that are, you know, teaching in many instances, unless they're knowledgeable about mythology, they don't understand the great scientific truths that lay at the basis of all of this stuff. Okay, and in talking about that, let me show you them. When we talk about the seven seals of, of Revelation, you also have to understand the seven chakras. Where you start at the, at the, at the, um, at the base of the spine, you have what is called Moldhara, M-U-L-D-H-A-R-A. -A. What I'm going to compare that with, too, is to show you in the human body, it's compared to the sacrum. That's an interesting place, too, because the sacrum is a bone that it initially it is in five pieces and then comes together in one. It's the sacred place. When we had the first planet that was discovered, remember, it was Pegasus. Okay, not necessarily saying that Pegasus is sacred, but these are things that we want to look at. In the book of Revelation, it's the white horse. All right. And in uh, the progression of the equinox in, in, um, in our atmosphere, in our sky, it's September and October. And, and, and that's, that's the bottom of that. Stuff. An interesting thing here is because I've been looking at this and wondering, I wonder if the first one is actually the seventh. And we'll talk about that later. What I mean by that is I find it strange that the very first horse that comes out in the book of Revelation is the white horse. And, of course, that equates to Pegasus, which was the finding of the um, uh, planet. But what I'm, what I'm wondering is, are they saying that the first is actually the top as opposed to being the seventh? But we'll, we'll talk about that. The second is, gosh, is something called and, let me know if I have this, and H-I-S-T-H-A-N-A. H-I-S-T-H-A-N-A. And that's the second chakra, which is the sexual area, which is, equates also with the constellation or the planet that was found, which was Virgo. And the second of the seals is the red horse. And the second is, of course, uh, October and November, okay? The third is M-A-N-P-U-R-K-A. That's the third chakra. P-U-R-K-A. The third is the solar plexus. The third planet that was discovered was Ursa Major, which is mother and child. And the third seal was the black horse. And of course, this would be November and December, OK? The fourth is Anahata. That's the fourth chakra, A-N-A-H-A-T-A, -A -A, which relates to the heart. The fourth planet that was discovered was in Cancer. The fourth horse is the pale horse. And the fourth, of course, is December and January. And the fifth is called Vishuddhi, V-I-S-H-U-D-D-I. And it relates physically to the throat. The fifth planet was in the conqueror or the coming redeemer, which was Boots. And then that was the end of the horses. But we reached at the fifth point, the primary concern at the opening of the fifth seal, is the altar 
and the fifth was uh, January, January and February. Okay. Uh, okay. So you probably have taken care of this one down here. So we'll go back down here to the sixth, and the sixth chakra is Ajna, which relates to the head. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. You give me Ajna, okay? <laughs> relates to the head. The sixth planet that was discovered was in Andromeda. The sixth seal is earthquake, which certainly is a head trip. And the sixth uh, would be, <coughs> and as far as the months, would be February and March. And then finally, the seventh is uh, Sahasara. What is it? How you spell it? S a h a s r a r a. S a h s a r a r a. Sahasrara, whatever the heck it is. Which is the pineal and crown, which planet is. Leo, which seal is silence, which month is March, April for Passover. And as we, we look and we go back and we'll, we'll take a look at these different things, but in the Bible, what's interesting about this is that as the first seal is open, the white horse comes out. And I, always, I just find that very strange. And this white horse is given the power to conquer. But the white horse is a positive energy. There's, you were here this morning, we did the Cat Stevens songs. There was one song that I wanted to play, you know, because all of his songs are very mystical. I don't know if you... you know, but he has a song called Into White. And um, one of these days we'll, we'll play that one, you know, the words of it. Here we are in, in, a, in, a, in a time of our uh, existence when we're seeing such, a, such a, a tremendous closeness to the conquering of some of the worst diseases, uh, in this particular case, cancer and AIDS. This, it's a time of great enlightenment. Uh, we've conquered so many of the things that... Uh, held us in physical bondage through, through the ages because of a lack of science. It's a great time of awareness. When we, when we talk about the four horses, I, I hope, are you done? I don't know if anybody's copying this. Are you done? Okay. When we talk about the four horses, you've got the red horse, you've got the white horse, you've got the black horse, and you've got the pale horse. And those four horses metaphysically equate with the four compass points. You've got north, you've got south, east and west. The white horse is in the east, the red horse is in the north, the black horse is in the west, and the pale horse is in the south. And the pale horse represents your physical being, your, your body. The white horse represents your spirit. The red horse represents your emotions. When the red horse is out of the barn, you know. The black horse represents your intellect. And, and the basis of that, too, is that the fact that the sun rises in the east, but its light is then consumed by the encroachment of the west. And so the black horse. And, of course, in the realm of spirit, uh, or what we call spirit, or, you know, that inner part, that inner energy, is uh, suppressed by the intellect. Th this is where, this is where problems of, uh, of, of like your kids uh, and, and people in, in religion have a difficult time. Their spirit is completely overwhelmed by the intellect because they, they'll look at this Bible and, and start a, a, addressing it intellectually, not realizing that it's mythology. So it becomes a, a real problem. So it's very important, though, to understand that in all of this, horses have nothing to do with it. There are no horses. There's no black horse, there's no red horse, there's no white horse, there's no pale horse. There's no, nothing to do with horses. 
Most pictures you see of the apocalypse, you ever see these terrible pictures of the horses, and then these guys sell tapes on television of the coming nuclear holocaust that, you know, this wonderful God that they worship as the Heavenly Father is going to unleash on everybody. But horses means something. You can't simply speak of the four horses without an understanding. The black horse is the death horse. And the black horse is the death horse because it is the intellect that cannot see the spirit or cannot understand the myth. And when you cannot understand what this book is telling you, then you go to church. And you sit in church and some guy with a robe on tells you this stuff and you say, oh man, yeah, oh yeah, brother, yeah, that's it. And he hasn't a clue. What does he know of polymerization? What does he know of the transference of electrons? What does he know of atoms being split? What does he know of the creation of the universe, which this book is talking about? He doesn't know. He knows that the lady was talking to a snake, and the snake told her she didn't have any pants on. That's what he knows. So the black horse, the, and all of the people that talk about the, the snake telling the lady she didn't have any pants on, all of these people are graduates from theological cemeteries, wherever they come from. <laughs> and, and, and so basically, it is the white horse that is the conquering energy because it is the untapped resource of the higher consciousness which overcomes the physical. When you get on the ride ho white horse and ride the white horse, you conquer the most difficult thing you have to deal with yourself. You conquer the thoughts of your mind when you ride the white horse. But when you're on the red horse, sometimes I get on the red horse. We all get on the red, and you know what a ride that is. That's a bucking bronco. And the thing is, you can't get off. It is the winged white horse, which is Pegasus, that carries us up from the lower depths of the physical to the higher realms of the mind and consciousness. That's what this is all about. Apocalypse is of the mind. I mean... We have all gone through, and, and in fact, tonight on, 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 on the television, I do the, you know, you might want to not tell anybody where you, you hang out on Sunday morning, because tonight on television, I'm doing the fact that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is mythology. <laughs> Don't put the bumper stickers on this week, that's right. <laughs> but you know, can't, can, to me... I say, gee, isn't it, isn't it great to be able to, to talk as intelligent, mature adults and say, is there a, a, a man with a long white beard who, who lives on a planet somewhere who will not forgive Albert from going to Atlantic City because, until he kills somebody? What is this? That's not silly. But it is not only silly, it is grotesque, and it is the foundation of your civilization. It is the foundation of your culture that this god named King Kong needs a human sacrifice, Lois Lane, whoever she was, in order for you to be free. I mean, please. Fay Ray is right. You're absolutely right. Fay Ray was offered up to King Kong. But this is the same thing. Don't we understand that in the ancient, the most ancient of times, the God or what was considered of God needed to have a human sacrifice? That's what this is all about. And the human sacrifice that became crucifixion in Christianity came because they misread the fact of astronomical science that was being portrayed here, the sun going through the southern cross on the shortest day of the year. And that is what this is about. The Sada Bra of Krishna says something that I think is interesting. The Sada Bra says, man does not rightly know the way to the heavenly world, but the horse does rightly know. Man does not rightly know the way to the heavenly world, but the horse does rightly know. Because the horse, horses are the natural tendencies of the mind. And the white horse is the one who conquers. There was a fellow, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, his name was Emanuel Swedenborg. 
And uh, he, he said that the, the horse denotes intellect. Wherever the horse is mentioned in the Holy Word, it signifies either true or false understanding. You know, it's, it is so critical for people of our culture in the West to begin to understand the Joseph Campbells and the Swedenborgs and the Carl Jungs of the world and to try to look away from the religious people who do not understand the nature of myth or do not understand the nature of these ancient writings. Because what you have chosen, what so many of us have chosen to do, is simply absolve ourselves from living in a, in a universe of, of consciousness and of understanding of how it works. We'll finish up here. I just, let, me, let me just tell you about the white horse for a second. Have you ever heard of Zoroaster? Zoroaster was the Persian prince of Iran, of what was called Persia at that time. And the sorcerers at that point attempted to have Zoroaster, the baby Zoroaster, trampled to death. So there was these horses that were in a stampede, and they took the little baby Zoroaster and they placed him in this, you know, wherever it was, out in the desert somewhere, and they placed him on the ground, and they left. And all of the horses were heading towards this place to trample the baby. But the white horse that was up in front came and reared back and, and, stuff, and just lifted him. So I mean, you could just see the mane flying, you know, and all of this stuff. And this beautiful, majestic, magnificent white horse lifted itself up and then came down with all four legs over the baby Zoroaster. And it was the white horse that saved the baby Zoroaster. Did it happen? Of course not. But it is the horses, it is the emotions, it is the intellect, it is the physical that will trample you to death. But it is the white horse that will stand over you as the, as the horse of the four quarters to protect you. <laughs> to this day, we involve ourselves in ancient horse worship. And, and you say, do you remember when President Kennedy, I guess that was, the, was that the last big, I don't even remember. But what they do is they take a horse with a saddle on it and somebody leading it, and they put the boots in the stirrup backwards on the horse. And the reason that they do that, the empty boots were originally fixed backward because in the ancient times it was thought that ghosts wore their feet backwards. But nobody asks where that comes from. They just do it. I say, then we, we salute. Nobody knows. Nobody asks. It doesn't make any difference as to why they do these things. But the horse is a mystical symbol of life and mind, and the colors of the horses of Revelation fortify their meanings. What you have when you pick up a Bible is astronomy, psychology. And what we've unfortunately done with it is we've made religion at it. Revelation 19.11, and this is the last thing we'll do, and then that's it, exclaims about the white horse and the second coming. And in Revelation 6, the horse that sets forth to conquer is the white horse, which could equate with Pegasus and the discoveries, and of course the hippocampus of your brain. The word hippocampus, which means horse, the hippodrome, which means the place of the horse. The hippocampus is a white eminence. Yes, sir. Absolutely, come on up here. Well, do, do, why don't you just come on up here and uh, wait a minute. Let me give you the thing. When you were talking about splitting in the atom, I read something in mythology not too long ago about the story of Creusa. It's a story about this maiden that was picking flowers on a ridge, and Zeus swoops down, takes her, she becomes pregnant. Can't deal with the fact that she has a child by Zeus of all people. So when the child is born, she hides the child in a cave, wraps it in a linen that she embroiders. And uh, she goes back to find the child, doesn't see the child there, figures that wild animals got it. As it turned out, Zeus sent maidens for this child to take care of it. Now she marries someone later on in life, and they can't have any children. So they go to talk to Zeus about this problem. While the husband is talking to Zeus about this problem, she sees this young man who is taking care of Olympus. His job was to take care of him. He was thrilled to be able to just take care and maintain Olympus. So she starts to talk to him and tells him about this problem that has been on her mind but doesn't equate it with herself. Rather, it's a friend of hers that did this particular thing and left this child. And he listens to her whole story, and he can't accept the fact that Zeus was the, fa the father of this child and she left it and all of that because Zeus is 
God. While she's telling him this story, and just as she's finishing, her husband comes from talking to Zeus, and he looks at this child, and he says to the child, you are my son, and he goes to embrace him, and he says, how could I be your son? And uh, while he's questioning that, the maidens come with the linen that the mother, Carusa, had. The linen had, she was able to identify as her son because she left him with him, and she had two golden serpents embroidered on the linen, and the child's name was Ion. Hey, that's good. Do some more. That's great. Wow. Isn't that great? See? See, you see what you find? When, when you have a, a little clue, then you read like he did, and you find, wow, it jumps out at you. Because Ion, what's your great constellation up in the sky? What's the name of it? Or Ion. Oh, absolutely. Right next to Osiris, which means the open eye. So all of these things then suddenly explode out to be scientific facts, not a bunch of religious stuff. See? So we're discovering so much and on the verge of so many wonderful things that will culminate when this great light comes down to us from Nova. That you know, I, I, it's you know, and 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 I am so happy to be part of the scientific community that says yes, there is a light coming upon the earth. And yes, it will be here in the year 2002. And that's what I ask you to become very sophisticated about. Somebody, whether the religion or New Age tells you something's going to happen, just say, show me some proof. Who said so? Well, you know, I totally respect the Dr. Goddard's and the Dr. Um, um, whatever his name is of the world, uh, of the Smithsonian, uh, Kirshner, Robert Kirshner. And, and when these people tell us that this is going to happen, we can take this to the bank. It's going to happen. And, and these are things that you should share with your kids. You don't want to share them a bunch of stuff because kids are very sophisticated. You can show them the Nova, and you can show them the fact that indeed the light from the Nova, the single eye, is going to touch the earth in the year 2002. And who said it? Some guy that was channeling? No. Dr. Robert Kirshner of the Smithsonian and Dr. Jeffrey Toller of Goddard Space Labs and everybody else. So it's, it's a very, very exciting time. So we'll get into understanding this because... Um, of the fact that um, we're just, you just made it, we're just starting, so don't worry about it. For <laughs> you, but uh, what's, what's, <laughs> what's exciting about this is the fact that when you talk about the supernova, and, and this is where we're coming from, when we talk about the supernova, which is the, of course, the eye, it is in. Um, the, the scriptures that tell us that it is at this point of, of the eye that the seven seals are unleashed. And um, that's why we're talking about this now. It is my, th let me just, and I don't mean to keep it, but let me just tell you this one last thing. Why I am considering the fact that the first horse, Pegasus, uh, the white horse, may be the seventh because of the fact that what we are seeing in the rest of the Revelation seems to me to have already happened. Whether it be the wars and the pestilence and the starvation and the earthquakes and all those things, that's old hat on this earth. We, we've been through that. Not us necessarily, but so many people. If at, see what I'm saying? That if they're saying that the first horse, which we look at traditionally as the seventh, but if they're talking in realms of one down to seven, this could be very interesting. That would mean that all of the plagues of Revelation have already taken place. It's over. And now we're waiting on the white horse. And why I am so curious about that is because of the fact that in fulfilling of the Coptic key, Didier Quilos in Switzerland and the other guy discovered Pegasus the white horse. So the plagues of Revelation may have already come and gone. And believe me, if you look back at the history of the world and, and illnesses and black plagues and all kinds of things that have happened and in earthquakes and in wars and in pestilence and atomic wars where we've wiped out whole cities like Nagasaki and Hiroshima, all of these things have already taken place. And so this could very well be the point of the white horse, which would mean we are now at the point of the fulfillment of uh, the first seal, 
or the seventh seal. Excuse me. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm saying the seventh seal may be the first seal. Well, it is the low T us. And low, the low is the bottom. Okay, low T us. I like that. And low T us. All right, Bob. That, that could be. But if that's the case, then we have more documentation to say the white horse, Pegasus, was seen by the scientist, followed by the single eye supernova, followed by the torn curtain, were there. Were there. Followed by the fact of the prophecies of the scientists that the light will hit the Earth in 2002. So we're pretty much there. As Dennis Miller said, at least that's my opinion. I may be wrong. <laughs> See ya. Please visit our new website at www.hiddenmeanings.com. That's www.hiddenmeanings.com.